And as everyone uh, trickles in, uh, Christian, just pleasure, pleasure to see you. Uh, been such a crazy year. So uh, shocking that we actually haven't been in the same room this year, but uh, good to share this webinar room with you today. Um, to the audience uh, who's joined, welcome to Friends of Nautilus. This is our uh, regular uh, webinar series where we talk to industry leaders about topic of relevance to change in the industry, to the challenges of owning and operating ships, um, and to the venture landscape and how uh, investment can help to drive significant innovation in shipping. Um, to that end, we're delighted today uh, to be joined by Christian Oldendorf. Christian is both a ship owner and an investor. Um, and specifically to the content we want to cover today, he's someone with a pretty significant and compelling perspective and a vision for decarbonization across shipping and logistics more broadly. Um, so we want to dive in that topic and unpack it a bit. Uh, we have a range of questions we're going to ask. If you'd like to ask a question, please do submit it through the Q&A feature and we'll try to address it if we have time. Um, and of course, if you have friends or colleagues you'd like to share the session with, it is available offline afterwards uh, for access. Uh, but, but starting now to say, Christian, welcome, welcome aboard and uh, happy to have you join for this conversation. Always good to see you, Matt. So likewise, um, so we, we're going to start broad um, and really take a, we, you know, obviously you wear multiple hats in life. Uh, we want to start with a ship owner hat first, um, mm -hmm. someone who's grown up in the industry and understands it um, from an owner's perspective very well. Um, there is, you will often hear in shipping, um, inside of shipping companies, um, across different stakeholders in the industry and certainly um, in the venture community and, and in the entrepreneurship community, that ship, shipping has been slow to adopt new technologies. Um, mm. And you know, I think there's, a, there's room to challenge that, that supposition a bit, but it's, there's no doubt that um, it's not at the leading edge of technology adoption. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering you know, what your perspective is on why that has been historically and if you see that changing. Yeah. Yeah. At the first of all, I can confirm the notion. I think there is this 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 feeling that that the, the maritime world lags behind when it comes to to reacting to to issues of current affairs, um, the decarbonization one uh, one in particular. Uh, on the one must understand that the maritime world is uh, is not to be compared to the car industry, for example, or the or the airline industry, where one has the chance to much quicker react to. To, to trends within the industry, especially because the hardware needs more attention. And in general, the hardware, uh, especially when it comes to, to how it's driven, is, uh, is being iterated much, much faster. Uh, because there's, uh, you know, with jet engines, you can exchange the, the engines much easier than you would be able to uh, exchange the main engine out of a, a vessel in the, in the same, same perspective. With cars, they tend to get replaced much, much earlier than, than vessels do. On the, on the side of margins, uh, I would like to point out that shipping in historically has struggled to, to maintain a margin and to remain a market in which margins can be made over a longer amount of time. And in order to plan your investment cycles accordingly, to be able to have a sustained amount of innovation, uh, budgets available for experimentation and R&D, and also the, uh, the certainty that these changes would be implemented, which brings me not just uh, to the the item of low margins, but also of regulation. I think that the regulatory part is uh, one to be watched as well, which has its own dynamic. Um, and uh, there are more, more driving forces in regulation now than there would be 10 years ago. And I do believe that these will, will change. These will become even more plentiful. Yeah, I t totally agree. And I think that analogy with cars, it's so clear in that mm -hmm. domain because it's so easy to ring fence a regulatory environment where you could have something like an autonomous vehicle, for example. Um, in shipping, it's much more challenging given the way that trades work and the way that uh, macro level uh, implementation of, of those types of schemes work across various port nations and across um, the entire global community. It's definitely, definitely the case. I, I guess it leads to an interesting question now though, because um, we definitely see more shipping businesses and more institutions inside the industry leaning into technology adoption what, what do you think is the major driving force of that change? Do you think it starts with regulation? Do you think it starts somewhere else entirely? Um, what's, what's your perspective on what's driving that new adoption cycle? So, so it's, hard to, it's hard to pinpoint one factor, but it is, of course, one is generational change. There's a, a generation that built maritime companies after the Second World War, 
uh, from scratch out of nowhere and that these these companies these family-owned businesses are slowly handing over to a new generation that has a that maybe hasn't gone to see as much but has spent time in in the business schools of the world where they've been taught of course that uh, when it comes to margins it makes sense to start <laughs> with uh, looking at your cost factors and trying to see how you can reduce it with, with fuel uh, being a major cost factor in many tanker markets in particular it makes sense to have an eye on that there's um, uh, a certain awareness of a new generation when it comes to climate topics, particularly because it's a 20-30 it's a year affair and it's a generational challenge. Um, there might also be, uh, be some part of, of, a, of a questioning of your own asset value, right? So if you invest into an asset today in the last 20 years, trying to assess the, the, the residual asset value uh, at that time, which is very important for ship owners, which is when most of your investment is, uh, is hopefully returned, the people, people don't quite, I guess there was a consensus for a long while that things wouldn't change as quickly as, as within one, one versus lifetime. But I think especially in 2020 and in the previous years, 19 and 18, there has been more of a, uh, a feeling that this is a topic that needs attention, uh, starting off with the banks. The banks pointed these, these points out that this is something that they'll keep more and more an eye to when it comes to their own loan books, for example. Yeah, I, that's, that's when we think about the drivers of change. I think there is... Those three drivers all make sense to us. There's the regulatory environment. There's how financing is changing to support greener investment and what requires greener, what greener investment requires. Uh, and also that notion of generational change. I think it's true even across generations as people adopt more technology into their lives, people live on their smartphones, people have engaged in social networks. It becomes apparent, you know, sort of the dearth of technology that exists in certain pockets of, of shipping businesses when the rest of your life is so technology um, mm. rich. Um, I guess, you know, the, the final question here as we transition more to the zero emissions focus, which I know is really core to your, your mission in life, um, mm -hmm. is, you know, this, uh, this, em this embracing of zero emissions inside the industry, um, do you think it's driving actual behavioral change yet? Do you think that you're seeing a big impact on that? Or is it really now at a much higher level, much longer term oriented um, with people thinking about how that behavioral change should come first before actually really driving towards those actions that will reduce emissions? Oh, I, I, that's a very good question. I, I do believe that there are several, several ways to tackle it. If you're, if you're trying to aim um, at, at, at portraying a picture in which there's a consensus that, that climate change needs to be tackled by most parts of the world, um, I do believe we're we're there now. We do most of Western economies have started, you know, picking up on this topic. Consumers are more informed than they were three years ago. Um, I believe the the, the steps that will multi-step process. I believe first of all, uh, customers of of all parts will understand. Okay, how can we reduce carbon emissions? Uh, speaking for Germany, sixty percent of all businesses have ninety percent of their carbon emissions in the supply chain, and just understanding. Uh, that this is something very easy that they don't have to tackle, but where they can pick and choose services that provide uh, a better offering when it comes to pricing and carbon and eventually the combined combination of both will give them uh, a new choice in the market. And these are products that are still developing to, to, to come to the market. But as there is a, a increased pressure of supply chain and traceability, uh, there will be more and more companies trying to become more transparent and offering transparent to the customers, offering it as their carbon accounting uh, in, into, into the end products uh, uh, cycle. And ultimately, uh, carbon taxation will reach these end, consum end consumer products as well, where some products might even become cheaper because they're s sourced or transported in a more sustainable way. That makes, makes perfect sense. And it's, it's a great segue into this question. I, I actually want to get a little more specific there because I think it's a really interesting topic. It's one that is becoming... Um, ever more critical in the U.S. as our election results are finalized and as there's a transition in Washington, D.C., this notion of cap and trade, carbon tax, carbon trading schemes, uh, you know, do you, I, I guess I question a world where this type of transition to zero emissions is possible without those types of schemes in place on a global level. Um, do you think there will ever be true impetus to drive towards zero carbon without those types of macro level um, requirements in place um, and without having to account for the actual cost of carbon emissions inside of a business? Mm, uh, first of all, I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily think that that is, uh, that is the, the key question. I think there, there'll be a macro approach one way or another. For most, most large economies 
uh, have understood the 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 effects uh, the effects that that carbon emissions will have on or the climate change will have on the cities. I mean, the it will cost uh, coming back to to the United States. It will cost them trillions to move all military bases to be able to move population out the way. The 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 yields of uh, the yields of crops and uh, especially the the mid mid to southern states will will decrease dramatically. Uh, so so the the effects are if you if you look at Naturally, you think you think you can elongate our current existence uh, into the future and say this is, you know, it's going to get uh, marginally uh, less less good, uh, and that's why we don't have to take care of it now. But there's a curve there, right? You know, with the the climate increase, there'll be a curve uh, that we can't see around at the moment. But anticipating this curve is is something that most economies have understood as a major geopolitical threat, uh, especially when it comes to refugee movement and so on and so forth. All these factors have been mentioned by the climate envoy John John Kerry as main factors for for uh, for especially American interests. But uh, it no doubt affects Europeans and uh, and Russians and Chinese in the same way. I do believe the world has understood that that uh, there's no. There's no imminent need to create carbon emissions to, 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 for the products in the world if there's a way to reduce them. And if there's a more cost-effective way to, to arrange transportation or production, uh, I don't think most people will be in favor as long as it doesn't, uh, as long as the cost of it doesn't outstrip their, their, uh, their expectations. I think, I think that's fair. I, what we've certainly seen historically too is um, policymakers, depending on election cycles and individuals and businesses, sometimes grapple with those long-term challenges poorly because they're so focused on the short-term trade-offs and benefits. And if there's no compelling reason to act, uh, the, the impetus is, is, is lacking for them to actually drive fundamental change. Um, mm. But I, I, think you're, I think you're absolutely right. And I am really optimistic on this front because it seems like in more and more places around the world, there is uh, an absolute commitment to this type of uh, change. It's ambiguous how it will be structured over the course of time. Um, but everyone seems to be aligned in the dialogue that it has to occur and there needs to be, you know, coordination across all components of the supply chain in particular um, mm -hmm. in order to actually produce a, you know, a CO2 free product to an end. Yeah. I would, I would agree that I'm a long term optimistic about the, about what the world will look like uh, afterwards. But I do think that the transformation, it helps to be a little bit pessimistic because it keeps you driven, it keeps you, keeps you animated and also helps you drive on the message because it won't just happen without uh, a certain amount of drive. Very, very good point. And I actually wonder that pessimism, you know, so we, you know, at Nautilus every day, uh, we're talking mm -hmm. to um, shipping interests of all, of all, of all manner. Um, and I think there is still a fair amount of skepticism in the industry. I think one of the things that you often hear from the folks who, whose concern is a ship um, is that if there is cap and trade, if there is a carbon tax, that that cost won't actually be borne out through the entire supply chain, but it will become some, somewhat punitive on behalf of the person who actually owns and operates the vessel. Um, yeah. I'd be curious to hear how, how you think about it. Well, ultimately, it depends. I would say that's to some degree correct because the, the disbenefit of owning a vessel, that, for example, um, uh, consumes, a lot of, consumes a lot of fuel, produces a lot of carbon, will of course be, be something that would be over, over strongly burned on the ship owner and the ship uh, as, as itself than if you would have a newer ship or, or such. But this is also a dynamic that has, to, that has to happen in order for ship owners to understand how to adapt innovation like Nautilus solution, for example, where you can already now with little effort uh, uh, go out and, and attain technology which would help you solve your problem. So uh, with it comes to, to boring out the cost, the ship owners will of course have to, have to bear out some of the costs, but it'll be, but as, 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 you know, as, as ship owners all incur carbon emissions, it'll, it'll, be, uh, it'll be on a somewhat level playing field depending on, on your potential and willingness to adapt technology to reduce it in, in my personal perspective or even operational expertise. That makes that makes perfect sense, um, and I, I and you know certainly for us when we think about um, problems that we can solve today, we tend to focus more on operational excellence and fuel consumption itself, um, and the imperative that you can see there for business results, and leave aside you know uh, a robust policy debate about what's right or wrong in the world, and focus on how we can change business metrics. That's also where we can see if there is cap and trade, if there is a carbon tax, if there is emissions trading, um, it will create another economic driver to focus on in the bottom line of business. But I think that has to be balanced uh, and, and the share of who bears the burden of that um, can't be strictly on uh, the ship owner uh, per se. Um, mm. I, I just wanna take a, a step back to, and you know, obviously an interesting thing about shipping um, is that it is an industry that both 
supports, um, runs on, and is a part of this whole integrated supply chain around fuel. Um, mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing, you know, with the, the major firms that actually produce those commodities, they have a pretty clear focus on CO2 reduction. They're making investments in different areas to, to shift uh, the mix of their portfolios away from carbon centric fuels. Um, I'm curious, you know, if, you, if there's anything else you would you would say about the role that shipping can or should play in that transition, given its fundamental role in bringing those commodities to market and also mm -hmm. leveraging those commodities to fuel the industry uh, every day, every year. Yeah, so so my my big my big uh, comment here would be that that maritime uh, industry will require massive amounts of energy, especially in the era of zero emission fuels to to make any change to to what we're doing now. Even now, the amount of carbon consumption and emission of the field is so massive that it is hard to how to underestimate, under, under states. There are 400 million cars in the European Union, uh, 400 million vehicles, and the 80 largest ships produce as much carbon emissions as these 400 million cars. It's, it's only a guise of how much energy is needed for, for these ships. And uh, it's the great potential of shipping. It could be one of the industries that could, uh, could, uh, could be the, 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 the ones that ignite the fire under a hydrogen economy, under an ammonia economy try and uh, retransport energy systems the way they are. Naturally, many of these will have to be funded by public, uh, public or, or state investors to, to kickstart such a system. But when it comes to, to selling the product uh, of zero emission fuel, shipping will play a major role and more than, more than road transportation. So totally, that makes perfect sense. Uh, and, I, and I'm curious, just to, just to shift for one second, when you take off your ship owner hat uh, and you look at this from the perspective of an investor whose portfolio is really broad and looks at a, a wide range of use cases across different um, components of this supply chain, where do, where do you tend to focus your time and effort in, in solving those challenges as an investor? And where do you think that the highest chance for um, a major return is in, in those investments? Like a major return? I, well, I, I do believe that there's quite a bit quite a bit of infrastructure work that needs to be done. And uh, I, you know, talking about, talking about yields, I don't think that the, that, that the interest in yield will necessarily be in, 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 in something that is, that is outlandishly experimental. I think the, the basis work of creating all the infrastructure for the zero economy to happen, solar, wind, geothermal, all of the, the energy sources that will be required uh, with our increased energy demand, this is this is a really good business. It's a stable business. Technology is known. The outcomes are known. If you invest in in wind and in, in solar and in, uh, in, in hydro, uh, you'll have um, a decent investment case for years. Uh, and my belief is that at some point, energy might ultimately be free. But until then, there's a, a good return to be made of it. Um, when it comes to technologies, uh, I I think I would um, I guess the the, uh, the energy management system. Uh, going beyond carbon is always going to be something that 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 one will have to look at on a more granular basis. Uh, not that this is only one company out there to try and understand the dynamics of one sector, but there'll be much much more work to be done in this for the next five to ten years. Yeah, I think it, it's it's a big part of the whole challenge, and our perspective would be there's the energy management challenge, and then there's the you know understanding the implications of those decisions inside of a business. So you know if we typically talk about data-driven decision-making, KPIs, operational excellence. Mm -hmm. The next phase of that dialogue is really about how do you assess the trade-offs that will exist in the future as these different types of fuels proliferate. You know, if you have the yeah. ability to run on LNG mm -hmm. or, or fuel oil, which one do you choose? Yeah. Uh, I'm curious how you, how you look at that decision, maybe both as an investor and a ship owner, um, you know, would you place a bet on one type of uh, technology to move forward there or would you really uh, opt for more optionality in the future? I think that is the, that's, the, that's the big issue. I think because this is a currently in Maritime a technically driven discussion, there's, a, there's an issue about trying to focus on one particular type of fuel. But my perspective is that uh, through the next, since we have to get to start decarbonizing now, and hopefully be at a point at which might have completed it in 10 to 15 to 20 years from now. My, um, my, my feeling is we'll have to transit through many different types of, 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 uh, of zones. We'll have an initial one where it comes to optimizing our, our combustion engines as far as possible, then ultimately changing fuel, then at some point using the same fuel, but in a different, in different uh, combustion cycles. It's, you know, take, Take a point at which you burnt hydrogen for a while and now use it within fuel cells to reach a higher, higher energy output through the 
to the in a larger uh, to low inefficiency of fuel cells, for example, and ultimately trying to understand how you can make all these work together. So, so I wouldn't, as a ship owner, my role is to transport items and to, to provide a ship. My role is not to decide the form of energy that I'll be using. I'm, I'm effectively just a, a part of the system and I have to be as, as uh, adaptable as possible. It's, it's been interesting to see that there are some firms have opted to, to really be vocal about placing those events. Oh, you know, ammonia is the fuel of the future and mm -hmm. therefore we're all in on ammonia. Um, our, our supposition as a business will certainly be the same, which is maintain optionality, build your business to be flexible, uh, except that the, the environment is going to be heterogeneous for a long time. And so don't over-index on any one technology the same way that you wouldn't buy all your ships from the same shipyard or have all your OEM hardware from the same provider. You know, maintain that optionality and flexibility inside your business for as long as you possibly can. And maritime has been has been has a history of having to be flexible. It's, um, the the effects of climate change will will drive our markets we transfer product from and to, and um, the dynamics of the of technical development will drive our well our infrastructure or the the, the the items we use on board. That's that's absolutely the case. Um, just looking at some questions that uh, we have here, and so one that I. Want to make sure that we get to, um, and I guess maybe just getting more specific on this point, when you think about sustainable propulsion types and fuel types, are there any specific projects that you're working on today that you would call out as being ones that you think will bear fruit sooner than later? Is there, is there any that you would highlight as being particularly interesting for this audience to consider um, if they're also looking at these types of investments? Absolutely. So, so as, a, as a maritime business, we are working on bringing wind power back to some of our vessels, especially the, the tankers and bulkers where through the deck construction, we have the possibility of, of placing sails. We are working with a company called BAR Technologies. Uh, they have been, uh, they've become quite famous for building the, the current America's Cup vessel for Team Ineos for the UK. And they do understand how to bring together the, the hydrodynamic and the aerodynamic abilities to create a, in this case, a, a high drag wing to, to, uh, to use on, on ships in order to, to then build a model around, around the weather to tell you how we can best apply it. So it's a mix of a, of a software solution with a hardware solution. Um, the, uh, we believe that there's, that there's gonna be a multi-step process here as well to introduce wind and then to couple it with newer energy forms as well, because of course, the recuperation of energy through uh, through sail drive and uh, and a propeller creating energy as you move through the water makes a makes a big difference. Um, with regards to the modularity of energy, we uh, we started a project a year and a half ago called Towards Net Zero, uh, which is uh, a quite detailed project um, with uh, ETH Zurich, with uh, Equinor, with uh, ABB as partners, um, where we have designed especially such a vessel that uses an electric engine and then stacks containers uh, filled with either diesel or gas or ammonia uh, or, or, or hydrogen uh, engines to then and tanks on top of it in order to make it uh, possible to modularly arrange your power system in a way that you can always use fuel that's available for your trade. So trying to be able to say starting tomorrow we can start using uh, gas or diesel, but we can scale ourselves the next five to 10 years into a point at which we only use zero emission fuels if the market should develop and if the supply should develop. I, it's a really interesting question. I, I wonder how you think the business model for those types of technologies needs to evolve as well. A thing that, that we've, I think you and I have talked about and certainly that Nautilus mm -hmm. will talk about at the times is, you know, for wind propulsion, how do you change the investment decision from an owner from, from looking like, $10 billion, of, $10 million of CapEx to install sales um, and then reap the return over the long, all, over a long time to more of a utility type model. One where yeah. you could say, based on the amount of propulsion I'm getting from my, my sales, this is what the monthly recurring revenue is and kind of shift the business model and tip it on its head. So it's no longer, I can't make this CapEx commitment because the ambiguity of the return is so so far out. Yeah, I think the, the, the big struggle here is that first of all, there's a there's a high cost for implementing the systems and, a, and a, at, at the moment, unclear, uh, unclear benefit. One cannot say, one cannot point, point down the trading area. So you are unclear where to start when it comes to researching this. <clears throat> if one could go out there and build a model in which um, one could assume how much energy would be supplemented through wind, one could assume how much carbon would be saved. 
one could uh, find out how much uh, engine hours would be saved. There's, there's money there, right? And if you have the chance to bring that all together into model and it actually makes, makes sense in the end, if you can make the assumptions that this will work out for you, um, then I do believe that there is a utility model in there somewhere. But it's, uh, it requires uh, someone going the, the first way, opening up their data troughs and uh, being able to, to educate the world about the benefits of this uh, without anybody having to take up too much, um, too much risk or even having to build one themselves. Yeah, it's that notion of, you know, first mover disadvantage at times and, you know, Absolutely. Who, who will be the parties who take those first steps. Um, I guess, you know, I, we have about five minutes left. I, there's just some other content that we want to make sure that we cover with you um, because it's, it's uh, fascinating to consider, um, and especially from the owner perspective, I think, which is, you know, the future of shipping. You know, when we think about what the industry in 2050 looks like, let's, let's assume that we've fought these hard battles um, mm -hmm. all, all this change that we're talking about has come to fruition, you know, what do you think that means for a shipping business? What do you, what do you think that means for the way they operate and the way that they are structured and how they go to market? Well, I do believe that at some point, uh, there is, um, there's going to be a more fragmented industry with regards to geography. There's, a um, I think there might be stronger regional nodes when it comes to transport systems that'll, that'll, that'll interlink an Asian one, uh, you know, a continental American one, the European one, and so on and so forth. Um, I, th I would hope that in the, that within 10 to 15 years, there would be no dedicated maritime industry as, as such anymore, but it would be an integrated world between maritime, uh, between the port, between the warehouses, but also between the modular transport on the way. So that the supply chain itself would be an orchestrated, an, an orchestrated uh, world where one could track the cargo, understand the, the cost and implications, the cargo, the, the carbon emissions and such, um, but also be able to, to reshift uh, cargo relatively quickly, be able to, to use uh, trade finance with a more dynamic model because all the information will be there. The moment it's a black hole, you know, you throw something in, in, your, in your production facility in Asia and it might pop out uh, you know, five days later as a surprise on your on your doormat. This is, um, this is something that, especially in COVID times, we've seen as a major risk. Brexit will, Brexit might, depending on the, on the terms, still underscore that risk. And um, we, should, should, we should do better, is my feeling. There should be a, a better supply chain because it has been so vital to production. We've seen this this year. It, it, yeah, it, it's, it's the thing that um, is, you know, it's a, it's a wonder that we are at a point where people are being vaccinated in countries around the world right now for a virus that was lightly known back in January. Um, and the supply chain implications of that are, are obvious as is yeah. just the way that we live our lives and perhaps even the limited disruption some of us felt at times due to, you know, we were in a lockdown in our homes, but we were still able to get the food that we need and the supplies that we need in order to run our daily lives. And that's a testament to um, the supply chain working. I, I guess maybe final point here I'd, I'd like to get your take on though, is to get to that point in 15 years um, time, let's say it's 2035 and a shorter time horizon. One thing that we notice is that there still is a lot of silo development, I would say, you know, companies will focus on port interactions, they'll focus on the ships, they might focus on containerized cargo, uh, people might focus on trucking and, and land based logistics. I guess, do you, do you have a perspective on how that needs to change? Is that about big incumbents coming into the space and really trying to unify things? Is that about a bunch of these um, smaller businesses really growing up to scale and then working on open APIs and integration of systems? What do you think is the way that will actually come to fruition the fastest? Yeah, it seems it's a good question. I, 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 would, I, would, I would have historically seen it as quite an unsexy thing, trying to, trying to orchestrate ports and warehouses and, and arrival schedules of ships and, and their crews and such. But the more I, the more I live and the more I see, the, the more I see how, how interesting the problem actually is, because it's not a, a problem of trying, to, of trying to make everyone understand. It's not a problem of trying to, trying to make, make people want, to, want to, to solve it. It's more a problem of communication. It's actually quite trivial. If you had the chance to, to implement a communication standard like you did on, on airplanes, where, where a plane that might take off in, in Paris uh, might be delayed because there's, you know, they can dissipate traffic in, in, in London's airspace. Um, this, is, this is not a, a problem for shipping to implement. These things are all there. It's more one of trying to, trying to force it all together, or trying to understand that there is, uh, that there's massive potential in this. So um, my, my perspective is that there will be 
uh, that, the, that this is a, a, a wonderful work to, to, to work with um, and that there will be strong efforts, I'm especially from the Europeans, from, from the Chinese and from Americans. I think all major ports have an interest in solving this because it uh, takes them, them to alleviate them of time and planning. One can see that the current congestion on US West Coast for, ports, for example, could be solved easier if it were uh, if, it, if the planning would have become a little bit easier. There's a COVID factor here as well, of course, but, um, but this, this is, a, this is a, a way of structuring, structuring the process. Yeah, it's, it's about that integrated decision-making. You know, we often talk about transparency, collaboration, open standards being things that will drive that change. And, and I think you're right that it, it, it doesn't necessarily make sense the way that it works today. Um, and the way that technology companies are, are approaching solutions is often oriented around that go-to-market model. But the more that those institutions can be leaders in that direction, and you name three major sets of stakeholders in China, the EU, and the, in the US, if they, take, if they take stewardship of that challenge and try to help to solve it, um, I think that's when we'll get the most rapid adoption across the entire market is when the leaders really do step up and, and make a forward-looking plan. Absolutely. Well, Christian, I realize that we're at time. I want to be respectful of your time and, and our guest Thank time. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on today. We're, I'm sure we'll have you back at some point um, in the near future. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your perspective on, on zero emissions and a carbon-free future for shipping. I've been looking forward to it. Thank you for having me, Max. Matt. Thank you. And thank you all to the audience. Have a great day.